Day and night, across the giant face of the continent, Australia's trains haul their ceaseless loads of people and produce. The Blue Mountains gorges rumble at the beat of their wheels. Tasmania's green plains echo with their passing. Spanning the brown outback of New South Wales, the Far West Express hurtles through a 90-mile strait. Threading town and distant town they go, through grazing land and gibber plain, down apple-loaded valleys, past scented hop kilns and tropical tobacco fields. The logging special, the Coonamble Mail, the Sunlander, the Inlander, the Overland, the Gan, Mildura Sunlight, Spirit of Progress, Westland, Australia, the Southern Aurora. Their names bringing travel, sunlight, and the dream of distance to all Australian minds. Trains that have helped to build a modern nation. There are many problems involved in running a network of railways that covers an entire continent. Australia is enormous. The mainland from east coast to west spans 2,500 miles. From south to north, 2,000 miles. Its area is roughly equal to the whole of Europe without Russia. In the early days, the different states could not agree on a common rail gauge. Each built up its own rail system independently and so created the break of gauge problem. In the west, the Northern Territory, in Queensland, Tasmania, and in part of South Australia, a three feet six inch gauge was built. In Victoria, and in another part of South Australia, five feet three, while New South Wales decided on four feet eight and a half. This is also used by the Commonwealth Railways for the Trans-Australia Line, and it is the national gauge which will link all mainland capitals by 1967. A traveller today can board a train at Cairns on the Coral Sea in North Queensland and go on the various gauges of five states across to Perth on the Indian Ocean. This is the journey George Martin is making, a Queensland railwayman on a busman's holiday around a continent. 4,400 miles by rail in air-conditioned comfort. This is the first part of the route George Martin will take. From Cairns, down the tropical north coast of Queensland, a thousand miles to Brisbane, the state capital. Then on again, 600 miles down the coast of New South Wales to Sydney. From Sydney, south to the Victorian border, and on to Melbourne, another 600 miles. This is a trip I've been planning for quite a time. Seeing Australia by train. There's a lot of this country I've never set eyes on. Flying's fine if you're in a hurry. But take those cane fields. From the air, you'd never know there were cane cutters working there. Going down to Brisbane, the Sunlander travels through the fertile coastal plain of Queensland. Further out west lies some of the best cattle country in Australia. There are places where they rail their cattle a thousand miles to market. Brisbane City Hall. Brisbane's the third largest city in Australia now. The Story Bridge on the Brisbane River. This is the principal port for Queensland. From Brisbane, you get a good overnight run down to Sydney on the Brisbane Limited.
Now we're travelling on standard gauge track. By the time we cross the river at Grafton, we're well and truly in New South Wales. You see the special fruit trains around here. It's the heart of the banana country. As you go further south, you pass through vineyards and orange groves. When the dawn comes up, you're near the Hawkesbury River. A long tunnel through the sandstone, a climb through the bush, and the Brisbane Limited is pulling into Central Station, Sydney. This is a place that can't stop growing. Plenty of new buildings since I was here last time. But that harbour bridge still fascinates me. The bridge carries a tremendous load of traffic, road and rail. Nearly 2,000 suburban train services run in Sydney each day. They need them with the population over the two million mark. On its run down to Albury on the Murray River, the Daylight Express to Melbourne takes you through some of the richest grazing land in New South Wales. This was sheep country from the early days, and still is today, when we carry around 150 million sheep in Australia. At Albury on the Victorian border, there's a change of locomotives and a change of crew. Then on across the Murray and Victoria's famous express, the spirit of progress, is gliding through a 200 mile stretch of peaceful pastoral country before it falls into Melbourne. Melbourne is the capital of Victoria, a prosperous city with a population approaching the two million mark. The city is the centre of the Victorian State Railway's 5,700 mile network. The second stage of George Martin's journey will take him 480 miles across to Adelaide, then on to Port Pirie and westward across the Nullarbor Plain on the transcontinental standard gauge, 1,100 miles to Kalgoorlie. From there he will go on to Western Australian Railways another 400 miles, westward again to Perth, the state capital on the coast. From Melbourne, I took the overland, the express run jointly by the Victorian and South Australian Railways to Adelaide. You pass vineyards, orchards and some very colourful country in the course of this 480 mile run. When you wake up, you see the Murray River again at Murray Bridge. Before long, you're running down from Mount Lofty into Adelaide, the capital of South Australia. Adelaide is a well-planned, spacious city with a population of about 600,000 and is surrounded by a fine green belt. It's famous for its parks and gardens. From Adelaide, I took the Port Piri Express. Port Piri is the eastern terminus of the Trans-Australia Line. You change over here from the Port Piri Express to the Transcontinental. The trans runs on the standard gauge 
and it's operated by the Commonwealth Railways. On its way to Kalgoorlie, the trans makes an 1100 mile journey across the Nullarbor Plain, the great treeless expanse that separates like an ocean the east of Australia from the west. One straight in the plain is 330 miles long. They say it's the longest stretch of straight rail in the world. There's not a drop of running water in the Nullarbor, so in the days of steam, water and fuel had to be freighted out to service the trains. There's no problem today, as Commonwealth Railways use only diesel-electric locomotives. When you're dining in air-conditioned comfort at a mile a minute, you forget that a hundred years ago, the only trains here were the camel trains of the explorers, fumbling their way across the continent for the first time. Kalgoorlie is the western terminus of the Trans-Australia Line. It's the biggest gold producing centre in Australia. A terrific gold rush started here back in 1893 when Patrick Hannan discovered the famous Golden Mile. But the only gold I saw was the gold of the wheat paddocks as the Westland crossed the wheat belt of Western Australia on the last lap of my journey to Perth. You see the occasional steam train on country services, but Australian railways are changing over fast to diesel and electric power, and they account for two-thirds of all our train mileages today. They certainly made my journey a pleasant one. Right on time, the Westland draws up at the platform, and with a 4,400-mile journey behind him, George Martin arrives in Perth, the capital of Western Australia. Perth is a busy growing place with a population of 420,000, beautifully situated on the Swan River. For the size of its population, Australia has a large rolling stock industry. It is well capable of meeting the needs of the seven railway systems, six state and one commonwealth, and of exporting overseas too. Whilst the rolling stock industry is spread over all states, the main concentration is in New South Wales, close to Australia's largest steel industry. Our need for carriages and wagons is met by building within the various railway workshops or by private manufacturers. Occasionally, however, when tender prices are favourable, or when Australian industry cannot quote early delivery, contracts have been let overseas. Few steam locomotives have been built in Australia in recent years, but there has been a big demand for diesel locomotives of various types, which has been met by Australian locomotive manufacturers. Considerable quantities of rolling stock of various types, including diesel locomotives and rail cars, have been exported or sent overseas under the Colombo plan. Our workshops must set a high standard of design and workmanship, for their products have to stand up to arduous and widely varying demands all over the continent. Alice Springs, for example, in the very centre of Australia, relies for most of its supplies on the Central Australia Line, run by Commonwealth Railways. The GAN is the train's name, commemorating the hardy Afghan traders who used to supply the pioneers. In the heart of the McDonnell Ranges, the Alice stands for the outback to the average Australian. 
yet it is the main crossroads of all Northern Territory traffic movements. Alice Springs is an important transshipment centre. Fresh fruit, meat, vegetables and other perishable goods coming by rail from the south are transferred in refrigerated containers to road transport units. In this way, road and rail combine to bring comfortable living conditions to the people of the inland. Coming into the goods yards at Alice Springs, you will see consignments of uranium ore from Tennant's Creek as well as mica, wolfram and other mineral products essential to the Australian economy. Copper ore from the Pico mines too. Alice Springs is the northern terminal of the Central Australia Line. The southern terminal is Port Augusta in South Australia. Here the famous tea and sugar train loads its 4,000 loaves of bread, its six tons of groceries and five tons of meat. The train is the village store, the bank and the health centre for the rail workers and others living along the 1100 mile track between Port Augusta and Kalgoorlie. The tea and sugar makes 50 stops on its weekly run and for the housewives at Pimba it's a welcome visitor. For besides household needs, it brings a welfare car with a doctor and nurse, polio immunisation and chest x-ray surveys. When the payroll for the rail workers is on board, there's always the risk of a train robbery. In the outback, the children's health is an important matter. And in the western districts of New South Wales, the state railways operate three mobile baby health clinics. The clinic cars move on a regular schedule around the more distant country areas. And the nursing sister in charge has living quarters on board. As well as running the baby health clinic, she also gives lessons in mothercraft to girls. For everyone making a living from the land, Australia's railways provide some form of service, bringing them machinery and equipment and hauling their produce to market and to seaport. Ninety percent of Australia's wheat crop is moved by rail. From West Australia's wheat belt, special freighters bring the grain down to Fremantle for shipment. From the cane lands of Queensland, trains of special hopper trucks carry raw sugar to the ports of Mackay, Bundaberg and Lucinda. In all parts of the country, and especially in remote areas like Ningen in western New South Wales, railways have always been the backbone of the communications system. Thanks to new fast country services, the tonnages of goods and livestock carried in New South Wales have been increasing by a million tonnes a year. The country station master today has to be a businessman as well as an expert organiser. Ningen, number 43 diesel arrived OK at 10.27. Among the 800 local freight trains running each day in New South Wales, stock trains are among the most important. The rails that opened up Australia's interior a century ago are still helping in the stocking and closer settlement of new areas. For graziers in drought-stricken areas, special low rates are charged for carrying animals for restocking their properties. 
In dry times, the trains also carry stock many hundreds of miles to emergency feed supplies. Australia's great distances affect the industrialist as well as the grazier. Spreading in giant strides across the continent, industry is continually creating special transport needs. To carry tin plate from the steel mills at Port Kembla to the canning factories in Victoria, a special train, the Tin Plate Express, is provided. To cope with heavy and outsize industrial equipment, the railways are ready with specially designed rolling stock. A 130-ton transformer ordered from overseas will produce additional power for industry. A rail link of key importance to industry is the line from Broken Hill in New South Wales to Port Pirie in South Australia. Special fast freights carry mineral ore down to the smelting works. Plans are going ahead for the standardisation of this line. Coal is the most important single item of freight for Australian railways. At the open cut mine at Lee Creek on the Central Australia line, a radio telephone system connects the locomotive and the yeah, brake van of the coal trains to Telford Station. Are you Telford receiving, GM20, over. GM20 to Telford. We have completed loading and we are leaving the mine now. We'll be up there at four o'clock. Over. Telford Station to GM20. Message received, number two road clear. Over and out. HRC 104 to GM20. You have 60 pounds of air. Over. GM20 received. Over and out. The five and a half thousand ton train is the heaviest in Australia. From Lee Creek, the coal goes direct to the power station at Curlew, Port Augusta, to generate electricity for the South Australian network. Yalorn in the Latrobe Valley, Victoria, is the site of Australia's largest known brown coal deposit. At the present rate of consumption, there is enough coal here to supply the State Electricity Commission, which operates the open cut, with fuel for the next 4,000 years. At every stage, handling of the coal is mechanised to the highest degree. Thirteen million tonnes of coal are produced each year for the Commission's powerhouses and for industry in Melbourne, 87 miles away. With equal ease, railways handle fuel for powerhouse and logs for paper mill. From the great eucalypt forests of Tasmania, the logging specials rumble down the peaceful Derwent Valley to feed the newsprint mills at Boyer. On the remote rainy west coast of the island, another important industry, the Mount Lyle Mining Company, operates its own rack railway. The train carries its load of copper down the wild King River Gorge to the sea at Regatta Point for export. Clambering undaunted over steep gradients, the little narrow gauge train has never heard of the great flat outback. At Marie, it could relax and ride pickerback on a standard gauge flat top wagon. The Central Australia Railway is standard gauge from Port Augusta to Maree and from there up to Alice Springs is three feet six gauge. The Commonwealth Railways adopt the unusual pickerback practice of carrying narrow gauge wagons on top of standard gauge wagons from Port Augusta to Maree. From there to Alice Springs the wagons can run on the three feet six line.
Quaker backing originated, they say, in the American Civil War, when army vehicles were railed to the battlefront on flat cars. Road freighters in Australia can cross the Nullarbor Plain by rail from Port Augusta to Kalgoorlie. A big saving on tyres and increasing profits for the railways too. Australia makes some 200,000 motor vehicles every year and assembles 100,000 more. The Trans Freight assists this industry by shipping car bodies to Western Australia for completion. Leapfrogging across the Nullarbor at express speed saves truck drivers from an arduous 1100 mile stretch at the wheel. When the Trans Freight pulls into Kalgoorlie, the bodies are transferred from standard gauge to narrow gauge. Before long, when the standard gauge track to Perth is completed, picker backing and transshipment will not be necessary. With a network of 26,000 miles of rail spanning the continent, track maintenance is a major task. In remote areas, manpower is difficult to obtain, and the mechanization of track gangs is going ahead fast. The Jackson track maintainer settles ballast and saves back-breaking work. Travelling through the various states, a visitor will find a variety of modern passenger services. Diesel rail cars are widely used by all the Australian railway systems. In South Australia, they are used on suburban runs. They are nicknamed Red Hens. Bluebirds, air-conditioned rail cars manufactured in South Australia, operate between Adelaide and country centres. A modified version of the famous Bud car, a self-propelled diesel rail car, is made under licence in Australia and used in New South Wales and in South Australia. There it provides a fast link between Port Pirie, Port Augusta and the Woomera rocket range. The Sydney Newcastle Express is another train that is attracting travellers back to the rails. In Sydney, during the morning peak hour, 330 trains come into the central electric stations. These trains carry nearly half a million passengers every working day. The City Circle is Australia's only underground railway. It is a loop line linking six stations and making it possible to achieve a speedy turnaround for city-bound trains. <coughs> On the City Circle's six-mile electrified track, trains travel around the loop every two minutes during peak periods. At other times, the average interval between trains is six minutes. Sydney's electric network stretches out to the furthest suburbs. The system has recently been extended through the Blue Mountains to reach Lithgow, 90 miles to the west, and Gosford, 50 miles north. Stainless steel car sets provide a fast, comfortable service for inter-urban passengers. In Western Australia, the state railways have designed a special inter-urban train, the Australind, to run between the city of Perth and Bunbury, 115 miles to the south. Another inter-urban express is Victoria's Gippslander, running daily from Melbourne through the Latrobe Valley to Bairnsdale, 170 miles away. A recent achievement in Victorian railways engineering is the Harris Electric train set, specially designed for Melbourne suburban passenger service. Like Victoria, every state has new rail progress to report. 
At Mount Isa in Queensland, there are very rich deposits of copper, silver, zinc and lead. Plans are in hand to expand production to 14,000 tonnes of ore daily. This expansion calls for the reconstruction of the 750 miles of railway between Mount Isa and the coast. The use of long lengths of welded rail has been common since the 1930s. Rail welding is done by the thermit and the flash butt processes. In South Australia, whole sections of track, including sleepers, are prefabricated and then transported to the job on special wagons. Over 4,000 miles of welded track have been laid on the Australian railways in lengths up to 360 feet. Before the new line can be laid at Mount Isa, the old rails have to be ripped out. The old sleepers are uprooted by dragging a heavy sledge along under them. When the new sleepers are in place, the new lengths of rail are fastened mechanically. Ballasting of the track follows straightway, a highly mechanised process. Once the hoppers have dropped their load, the grader levels off the ballast. The 750 miles of track will cost about 30 million pounds, a long-term investment in Australia's future. It will be paid for many times over as increasing supplies of mineral ore poured into the refinery at the port of Townsville on the way to the world's markets. Another national investment, costing £12 million, is already paying for itself. The new 189-mile standard gauge line from Albury on the Victorian border through to Melbourne. For 80 years, passengers travelling from New South Wales to Victoria had to change trains in the early hours of the morning at Albury. Now they cruise through with style, speed and comfort. The time has arrived when Australian railways are winning back passengers and freight with new services. Two new 14-car expresses costing a million pounds each have been put into service on the Sydney-Melbourne run. With a top speed of 80 miles per hour, they have brought streamlining to the schedules and luxury to the passengers. A new chapter in interstate transport has begun, with trains running on one unbroken gauge from Brisbane to Sydney and Sydney to Melbourne. In Western Australia, an even greater standard gauge project is taking shape. The surveying of a new 420 mile line that will link Kalgoorlie to Perth and carry iron ore from Coolia Nobbing to a new iron and steel works to be built on the coast at Quinana. This 41 million pound line will halve the running time from Kalgoorlie to Perth. As ore production increases at Coolia Nobbing, it will carry three times as much freight. With over 2,000 miles of new permanent way being planned and built, the day is approaching when one long standard rail will reach across the continent from coast to coast. A great national channel of steel bearing a swelling tide of traffic that will carry Australia to greater prosperity and progress. Music